give it another few seconds and then we will get started. And I should announce, you'll see maybe on your screen that the meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on the Nest website. Great, so welcome everybody. Um, this is the last uh, presentation in the Distinguished Speaker Series for this year. Uh, more to come in the fall and hopefully in person in the fall. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that Carolina Werner will be presenting today. And I have asked Leah Huffman to present the land acknowledgement. I would, like to rec I would like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Chinunctin nations, on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish With One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples, First Nation, Métis, and Inuit whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. Please join me in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we are and can each in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And now, Kim, would you like to do the introductions, please? Yes, thank you so much. I'm Kim Ruan from uh, Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies and an affiliate member uh, uh, with the uh, TJ Center. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not Dr. Joanna Quinn, who many of you may know was slated to introduce our speaker today and to moderate the session. Um, Dr. Quinn is not able to be here, um, but I am poor substitute as I am uh, delighted to step in. There will be time for Q&A, as you all know, you're welcome to put your comments, um, questions into the chat or to raise your hand. Um, and I will also say I'm pleased to give this thoughtful introduction in Joanna Quinn's words, uh, welcoming our speaker. So per us, uh, it is our great pleasure to introduce Dr. Carolina Werner to you this afternoon. As you know, Carolina is a NEST postdoctoral research uh, associate in the Center for Transitional Justice and Post-Conflict Reconstruction here at the University of Western Ontario. She holds a PhD in global governance from the Belsilli School of International Affairs and specializes in governance, inclusion, and peace and conflict, especially in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Werner's doctoral work focused explicitly on questions of indigenous governance. In that work, she focused on three governance systems in Botswana, Zambia, and Uganda. And in that work, she argued both that the formal inclusion of traditional institutions into state governance promotes peace, and conversely, that the cause of conflict in Uganda is a lack of formal inclusion of traditional instructions, of traditional institutions in governance. Here at Western, she has been exploring how indigenous groups are permitted to engage with the state and the response of the state to those groups. And in this, she is looking at the African context in comparative frame with the Canadian First Nations context to ask questions about the legitimacy and recognition of traditional leadership and governance. Her work really positions her as a thought leader in this area. Dr. Werner has previously held appointments at the University of Ottawa, at the Center for in International Governance Innovation, with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Her work has been recognized with a number of grants and awards, including from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council and the International Development Research Center. 
And it is so fortunate for us that she has chosen to make her scholarly home at Western here with us for the past couple of years. So without further ado, uh, we ask you to join us in welcoming Dr. Carolina Werner this afternoon. Wow, thank you. That, that was a very kind introduction. Thank you to both of you, Kim and, and Joanna. I very much appreciate that. I was not expecting such a... <laughs> um, thank you. I So I want to, just before I start, briefly refer back to the land acknowledgement. Um, as Leah said, we are visitors here on lands belonging to Indigenous peoples, and this is particularly important to keep in mind as I present on how states have done their best to erase, marginalize, and avoid their obligations toward Indigenous peoples. It's with this in mind that I want to highlight the narratives and ideas states have used to evade these obligations um, and to acknowledge that we are aware that these seemingly virtuous and benevolent words are in fact hiding the true imperial intentions behind them, those of maintaining power, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. This project started as part of my work on trying to understand the relationship between the state and Indigenous governance, and how Indigenous governance uh, shapes and influences the broader governance system. And part of this was, of course, looking at the process of adopting the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. When studying how states have responded to UNDRIP and the prog progress of the adoption of the indigenous, uh, of, ind of indigenous rights internationally, it became clear that states are moving at a snail's pace, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, given the passing of UNDRIP in 2007, the expectation might have been that 15 years later, states would have begun aligning their laws with the declaration. And while there has been some progress in different places, the opposition has been very clear. And this opposition, or rather how this opposition is articulated, appears to be similar across many countries. The prevailing narrative signal virtuous and benevolent intentions while stalling and evading responsibilities related to the recognition of indigenous rights. But let me first explain why I'm using the term operationalizing virtue. If words are political, and I believe that they are, then the word state, states use to protect themselves from having to acknowledge indigenous rights are influential and important. And as we might expect, state responses have been more about virtuous words than actions. <clears throat> I borrow the term operationalizing virtue from Gompal scholar Eileen Morton Robinson, who in her 2015 book on white possessiveness connects virtue with possession in describing how states operationalize it to control and dominate. You can see I included a quote here from her book, and I know it's on the long side, there's no need to, to read it fully, but I highlighted those sections that stood out to me. Morton Robinson basically connects the seemingly virtuous behavior and discourse of states to possessiveness and how this upholds patriarchal white sovereignty. Um, she suggests that there is a fear there of lack of control or possession of that which states cannot own, which is the indigenous, the sovereignty of the indigenous other. This fear of potential loss of control means that the state employs virtue to maintain racial and gender dominance disguising its actions as not only good governance, but also common sense or rationality. The state basically creates an image of itself as benevolent uh, and virtuous by calling on certain ideas and concepts that seem intrinsically positive, such as unity, for example. States across the world seem to have these narratives in common, mostly around very specific themes of unity, security, and development. Um, these are spurred on by concerns for state reputation and are rooted in colonialism and coloniality or the ongoing influence of the colonial matrix of power. And this is what I would like to talk about today. So just briefly as uh, by means of an outline, um, I will start off with unity, uh, then talk about security and, and followed by development. I will discuss each in turn and offer examples from various 
places around the world, including Canada, you will find I also have many many examples from Africa because that's where uh, a lot of my work has been. And I uh, know that many of these examples might be familiar to you, but I want to highlight the connections and, and the, the common themes. I will briefly also speak about uh, issues of state reputation, because I think it is an important motivator for these virtuous and benevolent narratives that I'm discussing. And I will look at how reputation is significant to states around the world in different ways. And finally, I will discuss the colonial roots of the narratives we hear about today. So let me start with the first, uh, first theme, unity. Uh, unity appears to be a catch-all phrase used by states in defense of their powers, sovereignty, and territorial integrity. It's often used in conjunction with peace, the implication being that a lack of unity would endanger the state while risking the peaceful life led by its citizens. By pairing unity with peace, state governments seek to legitimize the notion of unity. Um, these arguments have been clearly articulated by states in meetings at the level of the UN, while at the same time stating their commitment to helping vulnerable minorities, typically through integration and development policies. By focusing on a unified nation state, various logics of exclusion are applied to those who do not fit the mold, and this includes indigenous peoples. Unity is used as an argument against recognition of other cultures, and in particular indigenous peoples who might be entitled to special light, rights in addition to those other citizens of these countries already possess. As a concept, it is often used, as already mentioned, in conjunction with peace by combining unity uh, state, uh, with peace, state governments legitimize the notion as a possible sacrifice for the greater good of all. The rhetoric is an attempt at operationalizing virtue. It appears to be positive, yet conceals assimilationist and discriminatory goals. It is also meant to hide the fear of loss of control or of loss of possession. And to give you a few examples of unity in action, so to say, um, there are many, and I'm sure you can think of a few, but I will, I will give a few examples for each of the themes that I'm talking about. Quite recently, for example, uh, China announced a renewed focus on assimilationist policies toward minorities, um, which includes, of course, indigenous peoples. And, and the government is arguing for what they call a collective consciousness of the Chinese nation as a new approach to policy, especially in childhood development and education, which basically means assimilation uh, of the next generation through schools. So teaching will no longer be available in native languages, um, instead placing a greater emphasis on teaching the national language as a way to ensure what the government is calling ethnic unity to reduce the potential for conflict. This in addition to already ongoing indoctrination, of course, of Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims in internment camps or what Beijing calls uh, vocational training schools. In the African context, governments continue to use unity as a rallying cry since before independence even. Uh, the first president of independent Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, used the slogan, One Zambia, One Nation. It has become symbolic of nation building and unity. It continues to be significant in policies today and, and um, often present in political narratives in the country. But of course, Zambia, like other countries on the continent, is a state of many nations, not a nation state. Um, and these calls for unity, I would argue, are used to erase the various nations within its borders. In Tanzania, this is even more clear. Following independence, indigenous and customary institutions were banned and are not officially recognized. Um, references to ethnicity were prohibited with the narrative of equal citizenship prioritized. And through the concept of Ujama or a familyhood, the first president of independent Tanzania, Nerera, sought to nationalize the concept of extended family. The implementation of Swahili as a national language and politics, education, and law was also meant to unify the diverse ethno-linguistic peoples of the country. And indigenous peoples such as the nomadic cattle herding Maasai were seen as primitive and were discriminated against and dispossessed of their lands 
and along with farmers and other herders forcibly relocated to what were called Ujama villages. Canada in turn, due to its diversity, has struggled with the idea of unity and defining itself. It has taken on multiculturalism as a policy to help shape its identity. Multiculturalism as a unifying theme reduces indigenous peoples to one culture of many that make up the nation state. Um, it assumes that indigenous peoples are connected to the dominant Western political system and must be accommodated and ultimately dominated by the majority. Calls for multiculturalism prioritized equality in ways in which had been geared to the erasure of indigeneity and shaped various policies around uh, reconciliation, very similarly to, to Tanzania. In fact, the infamous white paper of 1969 in Canada was meant to create such equality. It was the release of that paper that proved to be the spark which spurred on efforts by indigenous nations in Canada to organize. The paper proposed the ending of the special legal relationship between Aboriginal peoples and the Canadian state, um, dismantling the Indian Act. The intention was to eliminate the distinct legal status of Indigenous peoples, offering them the same citizenship and rights and responsibilities as other Canadians. Uh, of course, this was met with an outcry as the paper was viewed by Indigenous peoples as another roadmap for their assimilation into mainstream Canadian society. There was an acknowledgement of the obligation, there was no acknowledgement, I'm sorry, of the obligation to hold up treaty rights uh, or maintain a special nation to nation relationship or, or any need for special rights for indigenous peoples. The next theme I want to uh, talk about is security. Security is often closely tied to the third theme, development. Security is frequently invoked when states feel threatened or need a positive framing to justify the dispossession and or displacement of indigenous communities. With security like unity, the implication is that the state is prioritizing the safety of its citizens in an effort to maintain peace. In many cases, this manifests as securitization of various issues to underscore their threat and the need for the state to respond swiftly and decisively. States have argued that self-determination of indigenous peoples is a threat to their political unity and territorial integrity, and by extension, a possible tool for secession. Despite the fact that virtually all groups seeking recognition work within the state framework rather than pursue in pursuing independent statehood, um, states still argue that recognizing indigenous nations will lead to conflict. Yet diversity and recognition of rights have rarely been indicative of conflict. And um, a scholar, um, Ulf Johansson Dara, uh, has this quote that I really like. And he writes that the argument that indigenous, human, indigenous rights provoke racial uh, or ethnic conflict is a version of blaming the victim. Furthermore, the majority of scholars working on indigenous politics agree that social movements around indigeneity are empowering and inclusive rather than exclusive. Most do not focus focus on alienating dominant groups. It is the state's need to define indigenous peoples and differentiate them from the non-indigenous that has led to tensions. Examples of security in action. So in Uganda, national security is very often invoked by the president to justify violent security crackdowns which result in human rights abuses such as for example, the disarmament campaigns in Karamoja. Uh, Karamoja is in the northeastern part of Uganda. It is uh, the region where the Karamajong live, a nomadic indigenous um, cattle herding um, nation. The government stepped in to help settle conflicts due to uh, cattle raiding several years ago, and in doing so used excessive force and followed up with forced sedentarization in the name of development. And I will come back to the Karamajong and, and this policy of, of uh, agriculture and sed sedentarization that, that Uganda has, has um, continued on. Australia. So Martin Robinson uses the case of Australia to portray how discourses of security protect 
support and maintain a system of white patriarchal sovereignty, linking this to state fears of dispossession. She uses the example of speeches given by Australian Prime Minister John Howard at a time where a court uh, following a court decision on native title where he used fear of dispossession to argue that the decision was a threat because it implied that indigenous peoples could potentially claim 79% of Australia and thus veto any development through these lands, uh, throughout these lands, and thus threatening Australians' prospects of uh, development. In Canada, in turn, federal security agencies are often engaged in criminalization and harassment of indigenous communities um, during struggles for land or collective rights. Uh, in 1990, media around the world turned to watch the Oka crisis developing in Quebec. Uh, you might recognize the photo on the slide as one taken during the Oka crisis. The conflict began with a dispute over land where the Kaninkahaga set up resistance when the town of Oka was to build a golf course on their burial grounds and ceremonial site. At its core, of course, it was a dispute over land and sovereignty, something that Canada saw as a threat to its own integrity and responded by sending military troops to put pressure on the Indigenous warriors protecting the land and ostensibly to restore law and order. Um, and funnily enough, the use of, of these words, law and order, at framing the situation as an emergency is also a public relations tool uh, often used by states that conceals the imperial motives behind the excessive use of force. Interestingly, there was an effort to control the public image of the military here to further the idea that the securitization of the situation was necessary and was the correct decision on behalf of the government. Um, internally, the army intercepted videos from journalists who were with the indigenous warriors and restricted media access behind the lines to the point that journalists complained that they were unable to provide balanced reporting. And then based on the reporting that did make it out, the operation was framed as a success, one that could possibly be replicated when needed because apparently the military performed with great restraint, uh, despite the fact that the state clearly used excessive force against uh, the much lower in number and outgunned indigenous warriors. Militarized RCMPM deployments continue against indigenous land defenders in Canada, including most recently in British Columbia, where the Wet'suwet'en uh, have been blocking the digging of a pipeline in their territory. The RCMP has deployed officers, uh, including snipers, so canine units, vehicles, even a helicopter and a drone. Uh, and the province even sent additional officers during the recent catastrophic flooding uh, in other areas of BC. The final theme I want to highlight is the development theme, uh, which is often difficult to disentangle from security. Economic development is frequently invoked in land rights arguments, such as when building pipelines. This then escalates, such as an example of Canada with security forces engaged to protect the companies and remove indigenous peoples from their land. Development too implies virtuous motives on the part of the state to lift its citizens out of poverty and better their lives, thus just justifying the narrative of a sacrifice for the greater good. Um, many states, ha states have adopted colonial style discourses focused on the primitiveness and backwardness of indigenous peoples arguing for their modernization um, as a way to help lift them out of poverty and integrate them into mainstream society. Basically, making Indigenous peoples and a development problem. Development policies are used as a euphemism for, for this modernization, as well as a reason why Indigenous peoples should and can be dispossessed of their lands. Um, the discourse of development allows for the conflation of decolonization and modernization in both settler states and post-colonial states. The good of the country that is positioned to have economic gains from the displacement of peoples is framed as a common good that will eventually also benefit indigenous peoples if only their livelihoods are uh, sacrificed in the short term. So examples of development um, in action, I will go back to the cattle herding indigenous uh, Karamajong in Uganda, but 
I could equally speak about the Maasai in Tanzania or the Ogiek in Kenya. These are all peoples who have been targeted by forced sedentarization policies. These neo-colonial development strategies mimic those of imperial uh, states as well as various post-colonial development initiatives funded and led by the international community. They focus on integration and forced changes to subsistence lifestyles rather than an emphasis on recognition and human rights. This has resulted in conflicts over resources and ignorance of the needs and wants of indigenous communities. But it also does not pay attention to the practicalities such as climate and environment. For example, Karamoja, in Karamoja, the climate is not favorable to agriculture. Yet despite this, the government continues to implement sedentarization projects, framing them as a positive development for the Karamajong. And there's a picture uh, here on the slide of, of uh, you know, Karamoja. So you can see it doesn't look very friendly for agriculture. In places like in Southeast Asia, like um, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, shifting cultivation, or what is sometimes called uh, pejoratively slash and burn, uh, and is basically the cyclical shifting of fields or, or regular alternation of short periods of cultivation with long periods of forest fallow has been practiced in the areas for millennia by indigenous peoples. Um, burning of the vegetation, however, was seen by colonial powers and then later by intergovernmental organizations as harmful to the environment. And so policies of, erad of the erad eradication sorry, of these methods have affected indigenous people's livelihoods. While studies show that the shifting cultivation is beneficial, including as a way to conserve forests, preserve biodiversity, reduce carbon, National policies have not changed and they continue to prioritize permanent uh, agriculture, permanent fields. As a side story, um, this obviously happens in, in many different places, but a few years ago, uh, I was in Tahoe with my family. Um, we were uh, during a hike, uh, reaching the summit of the mountain. We happened upon a ranger talk. Um, and uh, it was quite smoky in the valley and the ranger was just starting to talk about uh, the controlled fires that they uh, light in Tahoe in the National Park. And he talked about how settlers in the early 1900s banned indig indigenous ceremonies that introduced controlled fires in the forest because they believed, well, A, that they knew better, but also that fire was dangerous and difficult to control. And so there was this fear aspect to it. But after about 50 years, the settlers noticed that there were no new saplings, no new trees growing, and that incidents of wildfires seemed to be actually increasing. They realized that without the periodic fires, uh, the seeds could not survive due to the thick cover of needles and brush. And furthermore, wildfires continued to increase uh, in different places due to the fact that the forest dried out in the summer. Um, so now they regularly introduce controlled fires in the national park, but it took many, many years to restore what they had destroyed. And actually just in December of, of last year, the state has, uh, the state of California, uh, California entered into a partnership with local indigenous peoples to reintroduce cultural burning ceremonies. Speaking of national parks, in 2008 in Peru, uh, conflict between indigenous peoples and the government erupted following a government decree designating a large section of a national park for mining concessions as part of a neoliberal strategy of trickle down economics, which were supposed to benefit the entire population of Peru. Protests erupted and became violent. The police used tear gas and bullets to manage the protesters and, and kill the man. And the effect was a violent response from protesters and, and uh, 34 people were eventually killed in, in the conflict. In 2009, in an interview, Garcia, the then president of Peru, defended the violent uh, police operation and blamed the indigenous Awajun for thinking that they could halt the extraction of natural resources in their territory. He said, and I quote, they are not first-class citizens. 400 natives cannot tell 28 million Peruvians that we have no right to come here. They want to lead us to irrationality and primitivism. This example 
combines issues of security and development, all focused on the principle of sacrificing the few for the good of the majority and tying in colonial notions of, of the primitivism of indigenous peoples. In Canada, as I'm sure we're all familiar, there have been and continue to be conflicts over natural resources where indigenous peoples such as the Wet'suwet'en are trying to protect their lands and environment, including the sacred river Wet'enkwa, and to assert their sovereignty over these lands vis-a-vis -vis the federal and provincial government and private corporations. Um, government and corporations in turn are employing positive rhetoric of development, growth, jobs, along with promises of environmental responsibility to entice the peoples on the land to stop resisting, but also to push a narrative to the public of the positive effects of such developments and to drown out the voices of indigenous opposition. Um, this, of course, has also called, caused tensions and internal strife within the Wet'suwet'en Wet nation. All of these themes and efforts to sound virtuous and benevolent are related to the pressure of maintaining a certain reputation by the state. Um, despite the lack of enforcement in international law, states comply with it to a certain degree, and scholars argue that the levels of compliance are related to concerns over state reputation. A good reputation offers relatively tangible benefits uh, that often outweigh the short-term costs of the compliance, whether in terms of you know, access to certain groupings, cooperation, uh, soft powers, and sometimes even access to, to certain funds. It's especially relevant to the recognition of indigenous peoples at the international level. While the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples may, may not be binding, it does affect international norms. Um, and countries such as Canada, whose reputation is of a leading human rights defender, cannot afford to ignore these norms. Despite its supposedly progressive stance on human rights, Canada, like other states, has resisted at times fiercely the possibility of its state powers being challenged. As a result, we probably all know it was one of the only four countries, along with the USA, New Zealand, and Australia, to refuse to endorse uh, UNDRIP in 2007. In other regions of the world, the principles of democracy, particularly in the form of elections, are an important part of the calculation states make to maintain a good reputation. Um, this, as already mentioned, may also be tied to funding schemes and maintenance of good relationships with allied donor states or other economic factors that drive this need to at least appear to prioritize the development of the country and its citizens. Of course, it's not clear cut and states make decisions about the value of compliance versus the loss of reputation all the time. However, it would appear that while the reputational costs of discrete violations of certain international laws might not be high, costs of sustained violations are higher. In the case of state compliance with UNDRIP, many have indeed entered a sustained pattern of non-compliance, although the narratives of virtuous and benevolent behavior are designed to redirect attention and save state reputation as much as possible. Even African and Asian states who dismiss UNDRIP uh, do so by attempting to explain their non-compliance as one of non-applicability uh, in a way to retain their reputation. So for some examples of state reputation, first I have to say that indigenous peoples have become very adept over the years of their struggles at putting pressure on states by using the threat of sullying their reputation. For example, in, in Norway, the protest over a dam which endangered the largest Sami reindeer herding system and a Sami village brought international attention to Sami rights. Um, the Alta Dam was first announced in 1968 and deferred due to protests and then again in 1978 and again was stalled due to protests. But in the end, indigenous protests could not stop uh, the building of the dam, but they did shine a light on Sami rights internationally and helped create new structures by the government in the form of a Sami rights committee. As such, the reputation, reputational costs for Norway increased with regards to the treatment of the Sami people and contributed to a renegotiation of the state Sami relationship. For many African states, crafting an international reputation has been a more complex 
concept. Due to coloniality, the work of attaining a positive reputation has been tied to international recognition. Support and maintenance of sovereignty consists of the ongoing need to prove to the international community that they are indeed fully fledged states. In many ways, African states continue to seek legitimacy externally to a higher degree than from their own citizens. Countries such as Uganda have maintained their waning reputation for the purpose of receiving aid and other development funds from international donors, most recently by hiring a public relations company to work on the country's image following a violent election, uh, following violent elections in January 2021. For now, issues of indigenous rights on the continent have not gained much international attention in media or in scholarship for that matter. This aligns well with the state preferences, of course, although the African Commission on Human and People's Rights has been an outspoken advocate for indigenous rights on the continent, and this will increasingly put pressure on the states. As already mentioned, Canada was one of the four states that voted against UNDRIP in 2007 at the General Assembly. In a move to save face, while appearing virtuous, Canada argued that the declaration was less advanced than um, Canadian domestic law. Canada did not fully endorse the declaration until 2015, and through the years, Indigenous activists have used Canada's desire to maintain a positive reputation on the international stage to shame it, not only into adopting the declaration, but also to highlight the discriminatory past and present of the settler colonial state using also other tools such as the UN a repertoire on indigenous issues reports that has called that have called out Canada on its ongoing problematic relationship with indigenous peoples. Finally, I want to talk about uh, what is at the root of these efforts to operationalize virtue. As Morton Robinson argues, it is the fear that drives this: the fear of loss of power, loss of control, loss of land. Um, the foundations are imperial and colonial, and these colonial doctrines continue to influence the way states deal with indigenous peoples, both in settler colonial states and in post-colonial states. In Canada, the doctrine of, of discovery remains that the foundation of many land and settler colonialism has limited and defined how self-determination and collective rights are being acknowledged and implemented. While Canada has shown some tolerance toward the advancement of soft indigenous rights, such as language, culture, and some internal governance, there's resistance against any significant steps towards self-determination, true acknowledgement of treaty rights, and actual nation-to-nation -nation dialogue. All steps taken have been firmly embedded within a state framework. In African and Asian states, similar goals shape state responses, although resistance is even more pronounced. Um, coloniality shaped by the international, political, legal, and economic environment helps maintain the structure and territorial integrity of these states while legitimizing colonial doctrines. The majority of African and Asian states remain firmly opposed to the recognition of indigenous peoples, seeing them as a threat to their existence. By applying the colonial definition of indigeneity, basically Europeans are the settlers and black Africans are indigenous, these states argue that all their citizens are indigenous. And they have been largely successful at keeping the discussion within the domestic realm. This means that the international level, such discussions uh, of the violations of indigenous rights on the continent are minimal. They've also been very careful to avoid using the term indigenous in relation to the nations within their borders, opting for euphemisms, for example, in Botswana, where the government calls the indigenous San remote area dwellers. Of course, because if they were to call them indigenous, there would be rights that would be um, need to be uh, 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 acknowledged. In Kenya, uh, the Endorois went to the Africa court to argue to be recognized as indigenous and Kenya said 
use the argument that the Indorois are no longer indigenous because they have assimilated into um, urban uh, Kenyan, uh, into the urban Kenyan landscape and thus far, thus therefore are not uh, culturally distinct. So using the assimilation, the colonial assimilation techniques against indigenous peoples. In Latin America, there've been several attempts at pluriversality in government as a way of acknowledging the role and rights of indigenous peoples. But despite these attempts, narratives of development and modernization through liberal marketization and natural resource extraction continue to be prioritized, influenced by the global coloniality and its, the related extractivist and exploitative hierarchies of power and capital. None of this is groundbreaking to anyone, I'm sure. Um, but the similarities across the world are striking and I think worth highlighting to acknowledge the ongoing coloniality of power and knowledge. States engage in what scholars have called slow violence against indigenous peoples by operationalizing virtue. The focus is on creating doubt, on omitting, on questioning motives, and on making seemingly logical arguments related to what seems to be positive change. It is about appealing to the dominant groups and prioritizing their needs as the needs of the majority and thus worth the sacrifice of the few. It's about systemic hurdles such as acknowledgements without legislation to support them or system-wide policies that refuse to adapt from colonial priorities. It's also about time and resources in many ways, how long and with what resources can various indigenous people sustain fighting for their rights? How long can states keep them waiting, even if their rights are acknowledged in courts? And how much time will it take to wait them out uh, are all questions that I'm sure states are calculating. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, comments, whatever your thoughts are. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Werner, uh, Carolina, uh, for sharing this meaningful um, and, and in fact, urgent feeling our research, your, your work with us. Um, please join me uh, in that appreciation. Um, we do have a wonderful amount of time uh, for discussion. Um, so I'd like to remind folks that you are welcome to post your questions um, into the um, chat function and I'll be happy to read them on your behalf or uh, please do raise your hand if you'd like to ask directly and I'm just going to move through our list. I, I do have um, two questions that uh, may in fact be one question and may annoyingly in the end be you know, a comment rather than a question. Um, and I'm happy to um, evoke my prerogative as the substitute moderator to, to ask unless somebody else would like to go first. So Carolina, I'm, I'm thinking about um, this work in relation to, with apologies, like my own interests. <laughs> Um, and so what really kind of captured me in your discussion um, was the political power of words, right? I think about, you know, the federal government's, you know, advertising, really, there's no better word of it, uh, their support for signing UNDRIP after, you know, resistance, refusal, denial, um, trying to persuade Kansas um, to, to not sign on. Um, you know, on, on, on websites supporting Indigenous rights, but specifically speaking to the aspirational nature um, of the declaration. Um, and I'm thinking about like Harper, you know, when he was asked about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls saying the issue has been studied to death, like language has power over us. You know, a, a, a group can be referred to as remote area dwellers so that they are denied uh, rights. And so in thinking about this power of language um, and the kind of alibi, you know, of kind of hearing for healing that the government, you know, offers for inaction, um, I'm thinking about like Glenn Coutard's work and Leanne Simpson's work um, on moving away from like justice, 
you know, as something that's involved in the kind of carceral system in, in um, Canada uh, to, to something that sounds more like radical resurgence or co-resistant movements. And as you were talking about the similarities for how colonialism, you know, operates and colonial violence functions um, through state rhetoric, um, I'm wondering, uh, I, I'm just struck by this idea how much that idea of co-resistant work uh, seems to apply. And I'm wondering if you have anything to say to that or whether that I'm just talking about sort of my own interests. Um, did you wanna speak a little bit about ideas of, you know, the refusal of the politics of recognition, for example, as Coutard might say, or Leanne Simpson's in terms of like choosing language around co-resistant movements. Yeah, I mean, everything you said, right, resonates very much with my own thinking and, and uh, things that, that I have been considering. It, the, the part of the reason why I, I did the presentation on what I did is because as I, you know, work on the things that I work, it just struck me of how common this is and how, you know, this, this idea of Canada saying that something is aspirational and taking, you know, years and years to actually commit fully. And even then, now that it has committed fully to UNDRIP, not really uh, implementing it, not really aligning its legislation with, with UNDRIP, uh, just now, I think in the mandate letters, um, there's, there's some mention of it, uh, and, but it's been years, right? And so, the progress is very slow and much of it is, is just, um, just rhetoric, um, on, on this idea of recognition. So this is something that I have also struggled with because there are different, different situations for different indigenous peoples in, 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 in various regions of the world. And so the, the concept, this, this discussion, you know, cultured in particular, when he talks about the politics of recognition, of, of, of recognition being potentially also a form of oppression um, and, and a new way of, of colonizing indigenous peoples. I think that that is very much um, something that many indigenous peoples in settler states and settler colonial states are, are thinking about, but is slightly different in the context of places like the African continent, where um, there is no recognition whatsoever that indigenous peoples even exist. And so without that first step of some sort of recognition of their existence, given how our, you know, um, our world is organized into states and, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the power hierarchies that we have without that first step of recognition, there is no way to continue on and, and argue for rights and, and be, rec be, you know, part of that community and, and struggle um, and, and effectively uh, pressure states into recognizing certain rights. And I think once you get past that first step, then, you know, considering whether recognition is even something that Indigenous peoples should be seeking from states that are colonial, uh, that are colonizers, they're colonizers, is, is a very valid discussion. But I also think that given where we are, some Indigenous peoples have no choice but to make that first step to be recognized so that they can fight for their rights. Um, I don't know if that makes sense at all, but I, I kind of went around in a... <laughs> thank, thank you so much. It, it really does to me, especially given what Simpson says about, you know, the culturally and geographically specific experiences of indigeneity around the globe. Um, and that, you know, a global resistance movement really has to account for differences. Um, even as we think, you know, I, I, again, I come back to the Canadian context because that's the one perhaps I know uh, best. Um, uh, but this idea of, oh, anyways, I will just say thank you. <laughs> I think I could yammer on for, for a long period of time, but, but, but thank you. Um, other folks who might have questions, I'm just checking uh, the chat. This comes um, from Carol uh, Mangbenza. Um, Carolina, what is your reaction to the proposed Anishinaabek Nation Governance Agreement signed this week between the federal government and five Ashinaabe First Nations in Ontario? And um, Carol has added uh, the link for us here as well. <laughs> 
So this is a very good question, and I have seen uh, I have seen the news on this, but I, to be honest, unfortunately, have not read much about it yet. Uh, so I I don't feel like I can answer the question, but I will follow up with you. <laughs> as soon as I read more about it, and I will most definitely have an opinion. I'm sorry, that's not a very good answer, but I, yeah. That's all right, thank you. Thank you very much. Terrell, did you have anything? Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, did you, you have anything? If you have a specific question that, I don't know, you, you want to expand and then I can respond, I would uh, be happy to do that. Well, yeah, my so I, I um, do my field work, so I'm a PhD uh, student and I do my field work not too far from in kind of mid North Ontario in a first nation there, not too far from these five. Mm -hmm. And he, he was, um, so the first nation I collaborate with um, invested in, um, in a windmill and it's a unique case of self restoration not self-governance, but self-restoration through renewable energy. And the way I, I examine my, my work with them is through the lens of not recognition justice, but restorative justice mm. in the sense that they're using their uh, resource base on the land to uh, reassert their not only economic development, but also just the pride of being able to own and operate something. Mm -hmm. And so when I read this piece uh, from us uh, this week, I, I was thinking, okay, what sense does it make and how come some nations, because those five na First Nations are part of the Union of, um, I think it's Union of Chief of Ontario. Mm -hmm. So there are 34 others. And I was thinking, how come five uh, were, um, decided to go because it's voluntary, right? So they decided to go and ratify that, whereas 34, um, for various reasons, reasons I don't know, um, are not, maybe not yet ready or didn't feel it was the right time to start um, severing the link to the Indian Act. So it, it's an interesting dynamic. Uh, and there was a comment from, from the, um, the Grand Council Chief and he said it's a daunting task to to make that step because it for some nation it takes them out of the comfort of the indian act and that's a very daring thing to say from a grand chief because it's the recognition that uh, some form of comfort and manufacturer dependence comes from the indian act but at the same time recognizing that it's an uh, outrageous piece of legislation. So it, it is interesting to see that th there's uh, governance uh, at, it's just, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to hear someone else than my own brain on this. <laughs> I understand your, um, and I will, uh, I, uh, so two answers, two things I wanted to say about that. The first thing is, you know, indigenous peoples are not monolithic, right? In Canada, we have so many different, so, so why five would agree and others would not agree is a very, you know, specific to the, 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 the nation's reasoning. And so I'm, I'm not that surprised that, you know, not all 34 kind of went for it. Um, I think it's just, you know, they're, they're their own nations, right? Those are the decisions that they make, even if they have a cooperative agreement with others, they have very independent views on, on how governance might work and, and their, their sovereignty. Um, with regards to to this question of the Indian Act, so when I first started looking in Canada and, and read about the white paper, I had that same feeling, right? That, well, you know, the white paper was meant to remove the Indian Act in 1969, and there was this huge outcry. In fact, it, it was the spark that started the Canadian Indigenous movement, you know, um, or, or the 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 meeting right after that and 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 this this kind of uh, denial of of the white paper and so I also struggled to understand and I spoke to several different people that you know were alive at the time and were part of the movement trying to understand what exactly was it that that you know that didn't work and um, 
for the white paper specifically, and I think for this maybe as well, there was, there was the, the fear that all the special rights and acknowledgements that the Indian Act does offer um, were better in, in a sense than just a lack of, of any of those supports. Because, you know, when we talk about equality, but, but what we really need is equity, right? We're talking about, about um, indigenous nations that have for so many years been colonized and, and for so many years oppressed and, and dispossessed and marginalized that equality is not enough, right? We need equity. And, and in some warped way, the Indian Act offers different supports for that equity because it acknowledges certain special rights. It is by no means a perfect tool and you know there's a lot wrong with it, but at least it acknowledges that indigenous peoples are, you know, a separate category and need those those supports, those special rights. And so I think in in you know to answer your question, I think that's where that um, uh, you know cognitive dissonance comes from, <laughs> where we know that the Indian Act is terrible, but it's also the only thing that's offering these special rights that's guaranteeing these special rights, um, if that makes sense. But I would love to follow up with you and talk more about your work. If you don't mind, I'll send you an email after this. Thank you. So obviously this isn't my area. And I know you're talking about relations between states and indigenous peoples, but I, you know, when I hear what you're talking about, I wondered, um, how much this also applies to the Pope apologizing to indigenous people. Because all the things you talk about, all the threats and the unity and the, you know, every step seem and the virtue signaling. And I just wondered what you thought about it. Sorry, it's sort of a cheap question, but no, I'm no, really no, curious. No. No, so so I I've been following I've been following that you know uh, followed the media and 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 also on Twitter a lot of the uh, the indigenous journalists that were there trying to uh, uh, see you know what what they were reporting on and what they were saying and it was it, it, it's interesting it so I mean with regards to to the vir the virtue signaling and 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 kind of the the narrative I think. In any situation, um, words are still important and apologies are still important. They're not enough by any means, but they are important. Um, just like, you know, states realize that words are important, so does the Vatican. Um, and, and uh, you know, it took, it took a long time, but there is a, a level, I think, of emotional relief that that it has come to this apology and the fact that the pope will come and and you know be in canada and, and talk about this so but of course any apology any political apology like that is phrased very carefully and very you know in very specific words again because words are power um so you know i think i think that this apology is 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 an easy way out considering that there's no guarantee that there will be follow-up from any of this. You know, many of the indigenous um, uh, reporters that were there, I don't know if you saw this, but they looked at uh, the uh, um, indigenous items that the uh, museum in the Vatican mm -hmm. has kept. And, you know, there's talk about returning those, that they should be returned and all of that. You know, actions as always speak louder than words. And I think that until, you know, some of that happens, uh, some sort of reparations happen. There's, it's it's not enough. I, I... But when you argue, maybe that words are actually damaging because we use the words mm -hmm. instead of doing the actions, like all the land acknowledgements, right? Like now everybody yeah. does them, the government does them, and so we feel good about ourselves. I don't mean to be insulting, but no. we feel good about ourselves. But then, you know, we don't do anything because we've we've replaced it. With this. I agree. So here's so here's my thinking on things like apologies and 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 land acknowledgments in particular. I I always struggle with land acknowledgments because I feel like I need to refer back to them and talk about them and and talk about what they mean to me and how I might, you know, make a change personally. How I might contribute to acknowledging this land both as as not just historically but as something that's happening now. And and I think that words very often 
in the beginning in particular. So when land acknowledgements first came out, they were subversive, right? They were meant to bring attention to something that people were not talking about. They were like, they would stop people and be like, wait a minute, what? You know, and, and now we have gotten to a point where, of course, they're just something that we do uh, and we forget about it very quickly. Um, but they did have this initial impact. It's now part of the conversation, but they're not the last step by any means. They're a first small step. They're, that small subversion happened. And now it's, you know, time to to make the next step. And part of the next step, I think, is that we're all starting to think, wait a minute, you know, just saying a land acknowledgement is not enough. We should probably personalize it, talk more about our role. You know, these things that are, our language does help, the words we use does help move us along. These are teeny tiny baby steps, but I still think they matter. I, a while back, had a conversation with students about, you know, does it matter when we, when we um, get rid of monuments, right? Colonial, uh, uh, colonial figures, uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, um, mm -hmm. Confederate monuments, etc., and it does. Symbols matter, all right. It, it's not the same as as making actual structural changes, but the fact that there are people that are living with the emotional trauma of constant reminders uh, of these symbols is is you know is important, and 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 taking down those monuments does matter to these people, even if it doesn't, uh, you know doesn't do everything it should do. We don't change the structures. We haven't changed the institutions, but it's a step. And, and I, I hope to be, you know, I hope optimistically that one day humankind will make more steps and we will, <laughs> we will end up where we should be. <laughs> but maybe you're an optimist because I can't help thinking that the people who think about the land acknowledgement and want to do more are already the people who think about things like that, right? And there's a whole bunch of other people who do it instead of doing anything else. I do think so, but have you always thought about the land acknowledgement or ha is that something that happened over time? You no, know, I I've think I've always we thought about these issues, right? Maybe not said those words, but I've thought about mm. these issues. And so, I don't know, I just, yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like I have to have the highs of optimism in order to get through the lows of... <laughs> I agree. <laughs> And are there other questions? I, I have a comment perhaps on apologies that leads into, uh, Carolina, a terrible second question from me. Um, and that is, I, I, I was thinking about what you were saying that apologies mean something, but they also have to be accompanied by action or, or Vicky, as you were saying. Um, and I'm thinking about Harper's apology, was that 2009, which was so momentous and yet it was either four months before or four months after that, that his government was appealing that substantive victory by Sharon McIver and Jacob Grismer in relation to um, trying to strike down um, C-31 um, or, or um, I can't remember, was, was it at, uh, C-3 at that point? I, I'm losing some of my timeline, but, um, but I was thinking about, you know, how there's this rhetoric of support and, and the rhetoric, think about language of reconciliation, um, and then these actions that undo that um, and, and, and make uh, the apology so performative. Um, and so this really leads to, to my question and um, I totally respect if it's not something you, you can or, or want to take up because it's invested in my interest. But when you were speaking about the white paper, um, I was thinking about, you know, and, and um, you know, uh, virtue work, right? Um, in relation to gender. You know, mm -hmm. and, and the National Indian Brotherhood's response, you know, co-opted, you know, like being co-opted into the service of colonialism in appealing mm -hmm. or trying to appeal the victories of Lavelle and Bedard um, in relation to, to changing um, the gender inequity of the Indian Act. And, and you know, the government calling C3, you know, I, I think it was equity in India, gender equity in Indian Registration Act, you know, and it just repeats the same problems. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering if your work is interested in or takes up um, the idea of virtue work by the state in relation to gender, either in the Canadian context or more widely. And again, I come at this from just my own interest as a yeah. GSS scholar. Yeah. 
So I haven't specifically looked at at gender issues, although um, I in in the African context I have a little bit um, in terms of um, you know uh, both the colonial effect on indigenous and customary groups that had women in leadership positions and post-colonially became more patriarchal, um, but also in the change that's happening now of more and more women uh, being included uh, as, as um, chiefs in different countries uh, taking up those positions of leadership. I have not, I mean, I know of, of you know, the, the, the issues of, of uh, mar- intermarriage and, and the loss of, of uh, status and all of that in Canada, but I have not looked at it closely. So I don't have, um, I don't have a, a straight answer or, or comment on this, but I think like with anything, when it comes to institutions, you know, they use words to make themselves look better, to increase their reputation, as I said. And I think we all know of this, but but I think it's our job to point it out, you know, and that's part of what what I'm what I'm why I'm talking about what I'm talking about, because I think there are many people that just take it at face value, right? Oh, the government, you know, they're, they're updating this act, they're doing that, they're passing this bill, they're, you know, saying that UNDRIP is, is great, while at the same time, you know, in the court appealing Indigenous children, uh, you know, all of that is happening. And, and, and a lot of people don't think about that. And so I think part of my job is, is, is bringing it to light and talking about it and pointing it out. Um, even if it if it might be obvious to to those of us who are following these these issues, if that makes sense. Thank you, Carolina. We we have a comment from Regna. Um, uh, Regna writes, uh, but there will never be closure if we take the possibility of change seriously. We get to one place and move on to the next. Yes. Yes. It's a never ending story. I don't think, uh, I, I don't see any closure. <laughs> I am, I'm optimistic, but I'm not that optimistic. I think I am optimistic because I think we can, we can not get ourselves into boxes where we need to have a closed model. Mm. And if we don't see what we have achieved as a set of of things that have happened at a particular time or not, um, we begin to be able to say, all right, this is something that can be a way of thinking about the world into the longer term. It's perfectly obvious that half the world does not hear a word we say when we do land acknowledgements. I think, Vicki, I think what I've done over the years prior to, to this, emphasis on land acknowledgements is just to stand there when someone asks me a a dumb question about First Nations issues to say, let me put you in contact with the First Nations person who can answer that. Because you should not be looking to me to answer it. I'm not the person who has the right to speak in that way. And I think it's we have had indigenous people speaking for themselves for some time. What we have not done is to make sure that anyone is listening. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'd like to put my emphasis. That's a very, very good point. Very valid, Uh, agreed. Are there other comments or questions? We're at uh, 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 3.11. <laughs> well, my goodness, uh, this was a really wonderful uh, gathering, um, uh, particularly in relation to this important work, Carolina. Um, please join me, everybody, in thanking Carolina and Nest uh, for our opportunity to be here together today. Thank you very much, everyone. It was great talking to you. Carolina, that was so wonderful.